for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm Danny Fingeroth. Um, I've done a lot of stuff in comics. You could look it up. I wrote a book about Stan Lee. If you haven't bought it already, go ahead and buy it. We're here to talk about Will Eisner and uh, his relation to uh, the Metropolis, which is a, another way of saying New York, or I guess you could say Gotham as well. Will Eisner was a native New Yorker born in Brooklyn, raised mostly in the Bronx, and we'll go into details of his life and childhood. But his work uh, throughout his career, which had several phases, really is almost always tied to some version of New York City, whether it was lightly fictionalized or, or, or dead-on serious uh, homage and, and history. So we're going to talk about that today, and uh, we've put together um, an incredible uh, array of people um, who I'm going to let introduce themselves so I don't screw up their introductions. Jerry? So I'm Jerry Kraft, and let's see, I self-published Tilson's books for about uh, 20 years, and then I signed with HarperCollins and did a graphic novel called New Kid that won the Newbery, the Credit Scott King, and the Kirkus Award, which is absolutely amazing. Did my follow-up book called Class Act, which I both uh, wrote and illustrated both of these middle grade graphic novels. Um, my connection with Will Eisner was, has always been from a distance, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. And I was always like a really big superhero guy, so I did not actually discover well, until I was an adult, so I had to do a lot of catching up, but I'm actually very glad that I did. David Haydu. Well, I teach at Columbia University, which is uh, where I am and why I have the, this very impressive prop of uh, <laughs> all the books behind me. Um, I've written a half dozen myself, mostly cultural history. Much of my work is on music, but a significant amount is also about comics including a, a history of the hysteria around comics in the 50s called the Ten Cent Plague. I wrote a collection of essays about comics. It includes a piece on, on Will. And most recently, about to be published in the fall, a graphic nonfiction book that I collaborated on with an artist, John Carey, which is here, called a Revolution. My plug is a, a Revolution in Three Acts. It's about vaudeville and it's uh, graphic nonfiction. But, my relationship with Will runs pretty deep. Over a period of about five years, I'd say, toward the end of his life, I wrote two pieces about him. One, a long critical essay for the New York Review of Books, and then one, a profile that was originally intended for the, the New Yorker, and uh, I published uh, in my collection, my essay collection. It's also, it also was in... Uh, Comic book artist. Art. Art. Yeah. It's in comic book arts, yeah. John B. Cook's comic book artist. So for those pieces, I interviewed Will pretty extensively and visited him twice at his home in Florida and spent a few days each time and stayed in his guest room. It's like the most, really, honestly, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. You know, waking up in Will's house and having breakfast with Will and, Will and Anne and going for walks with him and talking with him in this kind of unstructured way over, you know, period of days was really quite extraordinary. And I'll, I'll share some of what and we have some photos of that. Related, related to the, the theme of the metropolis later. So that's me. And that's my connection to Will. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Levitt. I ran DC comics for many years. I've written stacks of comics over the years, including one little seven page spirit story. Um, but mostly got to know Will originally as a comic fan covering his deeds and misdeeds in my fanzine and then later as the publisher of the Spirit Archives at DC. Will was very happy at one point, the, uh, one, of the, one of the editions of the Spirit Archives outsold the corresponding volume of Superman Archives and he said, finally I've outsold Superman. <laughs> but uh, I got to write a book about Will and his effect on the graphic novel, Will Eisner, champion of the graphic novel for Abrams. Still in print. Most of you do not have it in your libraries. Please run out and buy a copy. And uh, Dino. I'm Dean Haspiel. Um, I'm, I, I, uh, what, gosh, I've worked with so many different people like Harvey Picar on The Quitter and American Splendor. I um, worked with Jonathan Ames on The Alcoholic and the TV show Bored to Death. Uh, which I got an Emmy Award for doing helping uh, the opening credit sequence. 
Uh, I've done some of my own autobio. Here's a book called Beef with Tomato. Uh, <laughs> that was semi-inspired by Will Eisner. I'm currently doing a series called The Red Hook. That's definitely inspired by Will Eisner. <laughs> uh, because it takes place in Brooklyn, and it's I anthropomorphize the city, which I felt is something that Will Eisner did in his own work, especially this book, where the city comes alive. And I think that's what a lot of the panel will, will also discuss, is how... Uh, the city, Metropolis, is a character and it breathes, you know, and, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I hopscotch between doing print and web comics and, and all that stuff, so. One thing I left out about myself is I'm the chair of Will Eisner Week, mm-hmm. which is an annual celebration of Will Eisner and his legacy and, and his uh, work and, and of graphic novels and free speech and all that good stuff, which takes place every March around Will's birthday, uh, which was March 6th of 1917. Um, Will died in uh, 2005. So um, just a plug for Will Eisner Week, if you have an interest in checking out the stuff we did in March, it's on YouTube under Will Eisner Week. And of course, if you yourself and your and or your institution would like to do something celebrating Will Eisner, Danny at willeisner.com or just go to the Will Eisner uh, website and um, learn even more or teach even more about Will. The spirit on the subway, as, as uh, we noted once before, although, although he calls, centri- calls New York Central City uh, in the spirit comics, somehow it's got a Lexington Avenue and Grand Central and Times Square. On the other hand, it's got an advertisement for the spirit by Will Eisner. So that, uh, this, this is Will in his 20s uh, working on the spirit uh, daily strip, which was different than the... Um, Spirit section, which was an actual comic book that was inserted into newspapers. This is where this is the New York of Will Eisner's childhood. This is the Jewish Bronx. There is a kosher chicken market, and and this is these would be the kinds of streets. I don't know if this is literally where Will walked, but this this was um, this was the milieu, the, uh, the poverty stricken or lower middle class or upper poor or however you want to divide it. This is from an era so naive that not only do they not have gluten-free bread, they proudly proclaim that they have gluten bread. <laughs> another, another era, there's a kosher deli. Uh, this is sort of a New York uh, Depression era photo. You know, I'm probably, I guess this is more in, in, uh, in Manhattan. This is the Depression era that Will, they were born in 1917. And there are some of the tenements that, uh, of the type that Will grew up in. You see, you notice the laundry. The laundry, is, 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 as, as some of us have discovered, is a big theme in Will Eisner's work. It's sort of that, uh, an indicator of people who are doing their own laundry and literally hanging it out to dry. And shown, this is from a, a story of his called The Street Singer. And so laundry becomes this real uh, framing device or, or, or kind of signal or sign of, of, of the people he's writing about. So this is, this is Will. And when I say writing, um, I did that unconsciously, but actually I, I had interviewed Will myself uh, a couple of years before he passed away. And he referred to himself, I'm sure you guys know better than I, as a writer with pictures. You know, he didn't see his writing as being separate. This was the fancy schmancy part of the Bronx. This was a, you know, an Art Deco building on the Grand Concourse where families like Wills aspired to live and where. And then the Bronx would have been to like the gener- Wills generation, a kind of step up from the Lower East Side. Definitely, it's, that's, that's a, good, a really good point. So uh, it's, it's hard to see it that way, but it would have been. And, uh, and Brooklyn, I think, would have been a step up from the Bronx. And then definitely Manhattan. When And I, we'll, we'll talk later about when he moved to uh, Manhattan. That was a, a huge step. Just right. into, well, I, you uh, know, you have to understand about the Lower East Side, picking up on David's point. At the time Will is depicting, it was literally the most crowded place on earth. You know, the, the images we have in our heads of Calcutta in modern times, um, or of places like Mexico City or Lagos in Nigeria, the Lower East Side was in that class of the sheer number of people who were jammed into that space. And Will captures that in some of his art, not in 
not in any of the pieces you've shown so far, but we may see, see that in a few minutes. By the time you get to the Bronx, if a family is living in an apartment, maybe they don't each have a room of their own, but they probably have a bed of their own. On the Lower East Side, it was not uncommon for people to have essentially shift rights to a bed. You know, you got, you got it for the day shift, somebody else would come and sleep in your bed for the night while you were, while you were out working at night and vice versa. And in the Bronx, you might have an, a bathroom in your own apartment, or at least on the floor, on the same floor. <laughs> well, the te- remember also that the tenements of the Bronx were built later than the tenements in Manhattan. Right. The tenements of the Lower East Side are, were what were called old law tenements. So they weren't required to have um, proper escapes or, or indoor plumbing. Or he- heating, as we know it today, there would be a single pipe that would go from the basement to the top floor and there'd be an area around the pipe of, you know, if, you know, say four inches around the pipe that the heat for the entire apartment would come through. And you, you would be able, I had lived in an apartment like this on, on McDougal Street when I first came to New York to go to college and NYU, you could look down into the apartment below you. That's right. Right. That's right. And I, I have a place in Brooklyn where you can, it, my there's a pipe and I can kind of see a little <laughs> bit of the apartment below. I could probably pass them like you know a letter. This is the Wood Clinton High School where uh, um, it was where Will went to high school, as did Stan Lee, as did Bob Kane, as did Bill Finger. Something uh, was in the water, it, right? It 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 was it was the it was the big. I mean, I think it held uh, like twelve thousand students at it at its peak. So. If you lived in the Bronx and, and you were a boy, because it was an all boys school, there was an all girls school called Walton that was nearby. But this this was this was the the school where um, I, you know I, I, you didn't have to take a test, but I think again just by the demographics of the of the of the Bronx, the I guess the smart kids were in the um, whatever these SP or whatever they call them classes. Will, but Will was involved. Uh, he was the art editor of the Clintonian, which was the, uh, was it the yearbook, Paul, or was it the... Uh, newspaper. Was it? it was a newspaper. And this is the Clintonian. And, and so, but this, it must also have been a name for uh, the yearbook too. Um, <laughs> some combination thereof. Will did the cover and then Will uh, did this illustration. So he must have been like 15, 16 um, the Bronx's Forgotten Ghetto Revealed is School for Crime, Dr. States. <laughs> That's one Bronx and one New York that, that Will drew on and, and that his generation of comic creators did. This is the other New York that, that Will uh, drew on that fueled his imagination and that of, the, uh, of comic book creators to this day. The, the New York of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers uh, dancing across a rooftop. Um, and then here's the Hollywood version of the Lower East Side and Humphrey Bogart coming back to visit in Dead End and sharing a cigarette with a suspiciously old looking teenager, you know? <laughs> this was the, the Dead End kids, later became the East Side kids, later became the Bowery boys who were Hollywood's version of the tough kids like these news, newsstand, these uh, newsboys. Sats um, Mahoney. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And Can then, I uh, insert a point about Will in his high school years. That's okay. First time I met him in New York, we met at the at the Princeton Club, and it, it was important to Will to be associated with with that world, with the world of, of higher learning and you know the intellectual world and Princeton. Uh, I asked him about his education, and quite to tell, in one of my interviews with him, we talked. He talked about DeWitt Clinton High School. He talked about taking pride in the fact that it was an all-male school, that it was uh, uh, intellectually rigorous. And then I tried to get records of his graduation from the school, and I couldn't get them. And I went back, and I said, well, it seems from the record that you didn't graduate. Is that correct? And he said, I've never admitted this before, but no, he didn't graduate. And he felt ashamed about that and embarrassed very insecure about what he thought was a shortcoming in his education. Actually, he had a, a deep education through all like the work that he did and 
the th thinking that he applied to you know whatever he did he was you know he was an autodidact and uh uh, and, and had a great mind, but he felt very sheepish about this. So he had this kind of, you know, was torn by these poles of pride in being an artist. His father was an artist and kind of shame by not having more education. And then a pride also in being a breadwinner from his high school years and supporting his family and supporting his family well and going on to be a tremendous success as a businessman. But his success as an artist and his success as a businessman, he saw as a kind of dichotomy, you know, and, and saw as two poles, two poles pulling against each other. And that, I think, explains a lot about him. But, and a lot of it, a lot of it, I think, almost circles back to New York as the center of the arts and center of finance and sort of will almost embodying that. Jerry, I've got some pages here from, um, you know, we've got to kind of move from the Wall Street to the heart of the storm. The heart of the storm, yeah. Very influential on you. And these are, you know, these are some pages of, of Will as a paper boy, um, uh, literally at, uh, I think at one of the, at the stock exchange or one of the major, this is his stock exchange in the background. And he's remembering this, I guess, in the 1980s uh, when uh, To the Heart of the Storm came out. And, and, and you can see sort of the, the, the New York thing of people of various different ethnic groups all existing. You know, you see uh, Will, uh, listen, Jew boy, don't get so uppity with me. And uh, then over here, uh, uh, Fungu, you dumb Mick. So that uh, so w uh, Will doesn't doesn't sugarcoat artistically. I mean, just just how he places the blacks right there, how it just surrounds everything, the movement using the city as a supporting character. And you know, I have to say, as an African American male, it is so interesting to read something about race and racism that didn't involve African Americans, where I could actually just <laughs> like read it and not have that same kind of like gloom and doom, but actually as a learning tool that I had never really been exposed to because any books about racism and all that that I had ever read, you know, someone like me as the target of it, but seeing fights here with the Irish and the Jews and the Italians and, you know, really seeing New York was just really amazing. It just wasn't anything that I had really been exposed to. New York has a, a long-standing tradition of racism or prejudice against the newly arrived. Yeah. So there was a day of the no Irish need apply signs back in, back in the day. There certainly was tremendous antagonism to the Jews and the Italians coming off the boats. And the population of people of color in New York, when Will was young, which is what he's trying to capture in this, was a fairly modest percentage of the population compared to after that great diaspora from the South that brought a, brought a lot of people of color to the Northern cities. Mm -hmm. That's af after Will's most vivid experience of all of this. So he experienced the racism at a time when, when there were different groups getting beaten up. You could certainly find people of color who were getting treated awfully in, in New York City at that time but you had to work a little harder to find them because they just numerically were, were smaller groups. Right. And were further, further removed from Will's personal experience. You know, I've often talked about Will's depiction of Ebony, which is one of the most challenging parts of his personal legacy as really being a function that when he did those early spirit stories, he probably had not had any kind of human relationship with a person of color yet. Mm -hmm. um, he was growing up in a very Jewish defined bubble, as you saw from some of Danny's photographs, you know, traveling streets with signs in Hebrew, kosher foods, all the, all the rest. And New York at that point was not so much a melting pot as a checkerboard. And you, you lived among your kind, and this was the turf of the Irish, this was the turf of the Italians. By the time Will comes back from his military service, he does his best to try to clean up Ebony's act a certain amount, because I believe by that point he'd experienced a wider range of humanity. 
population uh, in New York at the time, but it was in the Tenderloin District uh, in Hell's Kitchen uh, in, the 19, in the 30s, between 23rd Street and 34th uh, Street. This is prior to the movement of the African-American population to Harlem. They were concentrated mostly there, and there was an uh, enormous amount of uh, racial tension around 1900 when there was a uh, the killing of a white cop by an African American had been falsely accused of, you know, as involved a white woman, as often was the case, and he would, false accusation led to a, a death, and that led to like mass killing of African Americans in that whole district, and they mostly then then began to migrate uh, up to Harlem. But uh, as Paul, Paul is saying. It, the city wasn't so much a melting pot yet. There was a district where the African-Americans were. There was a diff district where the Germans were, a different district where the Italians were. And they didn't mingle uh, terribly much. So this, this here is Tudor City. This is classic New York, right? There's Tudor City where Will had a studio. And Tudor City is very fancy. And yet right behind it, there's classic Will Eisner tenements with laundry hanging, right? I mean, there's... Uh, even even worse than that, in the other direction, Danny, in those years, Tudor City faced the uh, slaughterhouses. Right, right. And that's now the United Nations building, right, Paul? Yeah. yeah. So the, the smells coming, coming off all that stuff by the East River were supposedly horrific. I, I, I can only imagine, especially in the, in the summertime. This is Tudor City. This is the area, I guess, to, to near, uh, you know, near, near the development of Tudor City. And then here's Will's years later version of the spirit in a, in a, in a similar New York street. The guy, it's really, it, it's interesting how, you know, many artists did, but Will so, so fed off New York. And, and then of course, this is his character, the spirit, which for those of you who don't know, came out in 1940. And from the very beginning, Will incorporated uh, all sorts of unusual um, layout and design and, and often put the character, the logo, into the background. This is one which is more straightforward of, of a cityscape. This is very early. This is from the, within the first month or so of the spirit. And, and even there, he calls it Central City, just like later on he called, say, Dropsy Avenue was not a real street. He used fake names. I think he wanted to be true to the spirit, so to speak, of New York, as opposed to being tied down to a specific Street. One of the interesting things about the visuals you just showed, Danny, when you compare that early drawing of the city to the, if you go back one or two, to the later ones, you see the depth of, depth of rendering. In the post-war spirits, one of the assistants that Will had for quite a number of years, there was Jerry Grandinetti at right. the beginning of his career. And in conversation with Jules Pfeiffer, who is at this point, I guess, the last the last w living witness from the Eisner studio. Al, Al, Jaffe, Al, Al, worked, didn't, Al Jaffe worked for him too, right? But not as, very briefly. Maybe very briefly. But, and that might, have been, that might have been in the shop rather than the, than the studio. But at any rate, Jules was saying about J Jerry that he was hired because he was an architecture student. Hmm. And he was originally hired to do basically to do the backgrounds because he could really render all of those city elements well. You know, if you know Jerry Grandinetti's life work, you are as likely to think of his later work, which was really fascinatingly surreal and visually cartoony in a very interesting fashion. But he started off being brought in very specifically because he could build that more realistic city around Will's layouts and designs. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and then, so this is called 10 Minutes, and this is a, a closer in view of the city. It, it, it's, it's basically the Bronx, even if it's called Central City. And the story is about a, uh, you know, a, a hard luck guy who uh, decides that he's going to rob the neighborhood candy store. And this, you know, this is the classic New York uh, Jewish um, Bronx candy store where everybody knows everybody. Uh, and you can just see this guy's life falling apart. He's playing pinball, and then he he accidentally spoiler alert. It's only you know seventy years later. He accidentally kills the uh, shop owner, 
and uh, and then he pretends that he's just helping out for the day, and then of course it's discovered. But the claustrophobia and what Will does, and just with that small building with the candy store, evokes a whole city. This, uh, this is another one of Will's uh, classic spirit stories that he always talked about as his favorite about uh, Gerhard Schnabel, who was a city kid who was learned he could fly as a child, but his parents uh, made him hide it. They wanted to be a freak. But this is a pretty bold use of a literal cityscape of a photograph. And, and then the spirit comes in, he and Dolan are, are chasing some crooks. And that last panel has been homaged or imitated a thousand times of Schnabel uh, jumping off, off the roof. So this is a, yet, he could go from the Bronx, from the Lower East Side to Midtown, you know, with its mix of old classic buildings and modern new ones. It's, in, it's interesting here that, that the spirit, I just uh, saw this, he's in Midtown with the skyscrapers and yet the spirit is having a battle on, <laughs> on a Bronx tenement. Eisner, even in black and white, evoking a, a hot day in, in the tenement in New York and the spirit logo is literally being flushed down the sewer. And there's the spirit who somehow inexplicably, we never even saw this. I don't think it continues from the previous installment. The spirit is just injured in the midst of, of uh, you know, come down, come on down and play ball. Come on down. Nah, it's too hot. And the spirit is literally dying as, as uh, these kids. Uh, and there's some laundry again. Uh, I really... Eisner had this understanding of New York Black Alley, another one with the subway, just incredible chase. I hate to give the short shrift, but it's, it's so powerful. You know, this, this stuff again, I, I always love that, that, the, that the people in the tenements are rooting for the bad guy. They, hmm? they're, not, they're not rooting for the spirit of the cops. Run, Mac, run. Uh, you know what's so interesting, Danny, is like when you look at this, there's so much movement in everything you know the direction of the train tracks the clothing the shadows and when i was really starting to get into his stuff you know i picked up the his comics things the sequential art uh, book and that was one of the most influential books that i had seen because i was about to just start going crazy you know and having all these angles and this and just every panel and then I actually found my copy, and I have on page 99, I have it still uh, taped off, where you've got um, Mr. Nimbus, and he just puts on his little jet pack, and he just flies out the window. And there's a whole section on why you don't have to go crazy, and how he showed it just like, you know, one panel, he puts on a backpack, and he does this, and he does this, and it's very boring. And then at the end, it's a surprise element which made it so much better. And it really reined me in because I was about to be like, remember when you first got your computer and you went to design something, you had like 40 <laughs> different fonts and colors and it was just blinding, but he really like put it into perspective with me and told me to tone it down. And that helped tremendously for me going absolutely insane. insane. On this page you're showing Danny, like the fourth panel. Yeah. Like it, if you were to do perspective lines, that doesn't work, you know, like, <laughs> but it feels so emotionally true, you know, like, because again, the city is alive and, and yeah, you could, you know, you could get away with it, but you're not worried about that. And like, I, I, I would have arguments with other artists that are like, Oh, the perspective is all right. Like, who cares, man? Like, look at that. That feels so real to me. You know? Right. It's like the buildings coming up to get a better look. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, like it moved to peak, you know? That's right. <laughs> and this is what we saw on the front page. This is, uh, again, on the subway. This is, you know, and of course, later on, this is more from, you know, the 80s, 90s, Will drawing and painting subway scenes. I mean, he could move to White Plains. He could move to Florida, but he's, uh, you know, and there he is in uh, apparently this 2004. So this is Will a year before he died. Um which is why everybody was shocked when he died, even though he was 87, you know? Um, so we've seen Eisner portraying New York of the 40s and 50s, in the 40s and 50s. Here he's portraying, here in the 70s, with this contract with God, of course, he's portraying New York of his childhood when he was inspired by the underground artists and, and, uh, and was comfortable enough to spend some time he went back to the New York of, uh, of his childhood with Contract with God, and which is really four 
novellas. You know, I wonder, I, I think a lot of artists, uh, Jerry, you can speak to this, and it, oh, I usually start with where the figure is going to be in the panel or on the page. I wonder if he was more concerned about the background <laughs> or the structure, oh. you know, and then put the people where they need to be. And when you look at his work, it's just Absolutely. It, the buildings and the background, the structures, and even the spirit logo, which kind of, it, it hides in plain sight, but... I think also, the, I think his idea of, of using the spirit uh, logo in, in the city was, was also uh, recommending what the spirit was about. It, it's so ultimately urban and of its time. Mm -hmm. You know, it must have so imprinted itself on him. You know, and I guess it could be in some ways any city, but really it's so New York. It's. I mean, look at this panel right here to the left. It's unbelievable. Oh. Now... You know, and then and then buildings became like glass buildings, like these boring, tall, kind of uninteresting. I mean, I think the last interesting building was probably the Chrysler building. You know, later in the story, it, it becomes more about him, you know, up to the point where, you know, there's a story of him losing his virginity to an older woman that I've, I've glossed over because it wasn't in the city particularly. But uh, David, this is that part really that you that you read before, you know, vacation's over. You're going to have a lot of responsibility. Your father is going to be traveling a lot, so he's will be the man of the house. Danny, I want to jump in on your, it could be any city. Yes, it can't, really. I guess not, yeah. You know, when you, when you think about the other major cities of the U.S., none of them had the, had the dense pack for as much of the city as New York did. Chicago had the benefit of having had the fire. So when they rebuilt it, they built it with the alleys so that you still, your garbage cans aren't living on the street in Chicago. They're hidden, hidden away behind your house safely. Most of the Midwestern cities, most of the Southern cities had more land per house. Even if you were miserably poor, you were more likely to have a little space of backyard. They didn't build vertically. New York was a much more vertical city than most of the other cities in its in its slums. The slums were the other side of the track in other places. And here, I, here it was everywhere and the track literally went outside your window because in the days of the elevated trains, those ran at the height of the third floor windows. We still have a few of them running through New York, but many fewer than we used to. And in the poor areas, it was omnipresent because that's what made the land cheap enough to be able to build tenements on and to house the poor. There was a distinctive awfulness to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 for the, I'm like 95% agree, but I do think there's some, you know, if you told me this is Chicago, I wouldn't go, oh, no, it's impossible. But in the context, of course, everything is so New York. There are, but there are urban realities that I think people in a wide range of places can identify with. But yes, in the context and the, and the dialogue and, in a larger story, yeah, it could only be New York. I think we see Chicago in a lot of these images because the elevated trains are still intact in Chicago. Right. They haven't been torn down in Chicago. <laughs> so if you go to Chicago now, you still see elevated trains where they've mostly been removed except for in the outer boroughs, except in uh, mm -hmm. mostly in Brooklyn and some in Queens and in the Bronx. And the glorious High Line, let us not forget the High Line. <laughs> Well, the 125th Street station is pretty high up also yeah, in, yeah. The, on the west side. You know, Will's just evoking a time and, and a place with those headlines kind of in somebody else's hands. It's the oldest cliche in the world, and yet he's got everything. He's got the atom bomb here. He's got... He was uh, so good at drawing weather, too. You know, Danny, I hope you're going to show some later images because it's really fascinating to see the, the evolution of... Will's aesthetic and how he reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced. And in time, instead of showing the entire building, he would just show the frame of mm -hmm. a window. Mm -hmm. And we would know that it was a tenement from the molding. This I just thought was, you know, always hilarious that here's, uh, you know, a parent, you know, Will's, if not Will literally, then Will standing on that cover, the Will Eisner reader, and somehow this kid in this idyllic island uh, or beach paradise is building a Will Eisner version of New York City out of sand. That's pretty, it's, it's hilarious and, it, and it's brilliant. Uh, and Jerry, this, uh, these are 
the covers of your books, the, and one has a Newberry uh, medal on it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I love how he puts the cities in there, and that's something that I definitely try to emulate at times. Of yeah, there's that's me drawing Co-op City in there and, and trying to do him justice. You know, I love buses and subways. I miss I miss those old garbage cans. You know the. the <laughs> The garbage cans, uh, the fire hydrants still exist, but the, the old garbage cans are gone. But I really miss those because that was such a New York thing. And then yeah, kind he, of put in the, you know, I, I love how he would use a prop, like a mailbox or a garbage can or something yeah. to tell a story around. Absolutely. And he didn't need the rest of the city because you already knew it was there. And then just putting in, so this oh, okay. putting in signs and all the, you know, things in there, little fruit stands and... But yeah, definitely um, something that he was a, a master of. Yeah. Yep, so now that that's my life. That's the brownstone. Right. So that's my brownstone in Washington Heights, where I actually grew up. So I put that in it. So that was a different kind of thing. And I grew up with a, the brownstone and the cobblestone street. So, you know, little things like that, putting in the, the sewers and the manhole covers and trying to pay attention to like the little flower pots on the top and then researching like in the when you're about to show research and getting the the light poles you know to show that this is a, a prestigious private school so i couldn't do any kind of light and staircases and it takes obviously twice as long to to finish a book so. so anything i can do to just kind of give props like that is is worth it and you give a real sense of place. The school becomes a character, the brownstone and the street becomes a character. Yeah. And, you know, this is for part of a sequence where you're maybe not as violently as in Eisner's thing, but you're, you know, you're hinting at the ethnic and racial and, and, and class conflicts here. Yeah. And also, he, you know, the, the father-son aspect in a lot of his books was just, oh, interesting. Yeah. just really heartwarming. You know, I love that. Well, yeah, you, your heart goes out to the father because he's such a good-hearted guy, but absolutely, but, but, but a dreamer. This is the heart of the storms we talked about that, that, had, that you had told me it's such a big influence. David, you had talked about the, the building. What's meaningful to you about this, this mode of will? You could see some of the suggestion that I was talking about earlier. One of the things that Will uh, brought up to me in my interviews was his affection for the theater. And he talked about his father taking him to the WP Theater. WPA theater and how he originally tried to emulate film in his work. And then he gravitated more and more to a theatrical approach, which is a, a more kind of symbolic or impressionistic uh, uh, approach of just suggesting with, you know, one or two details and letting the imagination fill in. We could kind of see that here. I mean, that's just a hint of a building. You know, the imagination fills in the details. He had a problem with the kind of uh, Mandarin idealization of craft and ideal and, uh, uh, and craft in the comic book world. He, he said, he, he talked about, people are always talking about details and details and details. Details don't matter. It's suggestion matters more than details. What you imply and suggest, mm -hmm. what, you, what you communicate through what you omit is more meaningful than, you know, than lots of detail. But there is something to the limitation of, of keeping it more theatrical, like theater, not movie, but theater. You know, in a movie, you can change all the angles and do whatever you want. And I also wonder, as you grow as an artist, that finding that reduction, that kind of sophisticated simplicity, you know, that that's where you're trying to hone your craft. And, and also, in a way... I, I call like certain people who draw like, you know, re over render and try to find a new angle. I call that voguing. Like it can look really good, but it's like you're voguing, you know, like you're, you're, you're getting out of the story so that people will notice how cool you are as an artist. Right. And I love that when, when you can mature as an artist and get to that place where a few suggestions can be the comic, you know, comics, as an art form, is a, is ultimately a reduction form, isn't it, in a lot of ways? It's, it's the great Alex Toth quote. I spent the first half of my career learning what to put in, and the second half what to leave out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. David, but of course, just uh, having, having said that all about simplicity, another thing you liked was Dropsy Avenue, and here's 
which is the cover of the, of the neighborhood. And this is about as detailed as you can get. Yeah. And, and, but I guess he knew when to be detailed and when not to. Like here, there's a lot of Yes and no, but look at the use of the black. Look at the room with the woman you know, looking out the window on the bottom left. There's really not, you know, a lot is implied there. There's a lot of negative space. Those first two panels employ negative space in a way that you don't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, like the black or even the white, what he didn't draw. David, so these are some of the photos you sent me of Will in the studio? Yeah, I took that of Will in the studio. Is, it, is this graphic? No I mean, this one is a graphic it's, novel. It's graphic nonfiction. I wish I had sent you an interior page or two because it takes place at the turn of the 20th century. There's a lot of imagery of New York at the time that Will yeah. was smoking and, you know, and his work too. I couldn't find anything online, so, but... Uh, no, it's not public. It's not out. It won't be out till September. And Paul, here is your book. I hear it's still available. That, wow. that, page, that, that page where he's spoofing the... Uh, fellow or competitive cartoonists. I think he was trying for the death of Al Cap. Right. Al, Al Slap was the name of the character. Al Slap. The, character, <laughs> the cartoon character was very secondary. Yeah, so uh, so people can get a sense of what the interior of the book is. So it's, it's Paul. A lot of visuals, but really tries to, it looks at the context that the graphic novel, depending on how you define it, has been around for a long time. But Will's work, particularly on Contract with God, was an inflection point. Most, not because it was the great commercial success of graphic novels, the way Mouse or Dark Knight or Watchmen would be about eight years later, but because it was really the thing that inspired many of the creators of that generation to be more daring in their work as they created comics. You yourself have done some New York. Uh, A very New York story. Very New York story, very. It kind of has an Eisner feel. Pulled together several of New York's nastiest mass deaths into one serial killer story. Okay, cool. And then the visitor looks to me like there's a bunch of New York happening there. Yeah, there's some lovely, <laughs> some lovely stuff on Roosevelt Island and at the uh, Terrace on the Park and the Science Mu Museum in, in Queens. Look, New York's a great stage set. And the, America is blessed with really two aspirational cities where kids want to be when they, they grow up by and large. New York and Hollywood. It's not even Los Angeles, it's Hollywood that the kids want to get to. And uh, New York becomes just a terrific reference point for all that. And thankfully, some of the changes they've made in arranging filming have had so many more TV shows and films shot in New York in the last generation. So that's really kindled it all over again. It's great stuff to play with. Thank you. And Dino, this is your... We'll be real quick because I know we're running out of time. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to come up with a cover for The Quitter, the graphic novel, the, essentially the origin of Harvey Picar. And I could <laughs> not figure out what to do with this title and an image. And then it hit me, Will Eisner. That's how you do it, Will Eisner. And you create like a little bit of a, like a sense of a city or something. And, you know, and so I, I remember scribbling that in a, in a cafe and then I just sent it to um, my then editor, Jonathan Bank. And, and I guess he showed it around. They're like, OK, this is it. Go this way. So that's sort of a. You know, and this is me doing like the theater thing, like keeping it in one, you know, the toilet bowl is the prop, right? With a couple of close ups. Oh. And, you know, for Picar, since he's not a superhero, for him to plunge a toilet is kind of heroic. <laughs> <laughs> You know, oh, so here's here's your own superhero. The well, no, this is this is actually the Fox, the Fox um, right, yeah. for Archie Comics, uh, uh, Red right. Circle, Dark Circle, and again, just playing with the cityscape and moving through it. And you know, obviously they were colored for the comics, but this is just the black and white, the train stations and the city, and and then you know, in some of my autobio books, I, I stories, I deal with certain aspects of the city. This this one's in Dumbo, but I'm also a Dumbo in the story. So it's a, a Dumbo entendre. Uh, and just using movement and and this is, you know, Will Eisner was so great with figure and gestures and uh, the spirit was always like falling or breaking apart or something. Here's the Red Hook uh, where I anthropomorphize Brooklyn. Um, it's sentient and breaks away, you know, secedes from New York, ergo America to start her own republic where 
Art can be bartered for food and services. It's all a dream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, th and that's on what website, Dean? That's on oh, that's on Webtoon. You can read all of it for free on Webtoon or buy it as a book at Image, you know, for now and, until I figure out what to do next. This was, I think, based on something. Didn't Denny O'Neill say that, uh, well, comics are good, but you can't do Shakespeare? And, and you pick them up on that day. Paul, is that anywhere near correct? Could I be. Don't, I've never heard that. Number I think but so. I think Denny said moment. And he said, oh, well, comics are great, but you can't do Shakespeare. And Will, I think, took that as a challenge. And so to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, whether it is no, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole, the whole thing. You can just watch it. But uh, Where was this published? I've never seen this. This, what is this? this was actually in, it was in Comics and Sequential Art. I think it was in one of Will's textbooks. Oh, wow. Um, wow. As, as an exercise to show what you could do. And it must have been late 70s, early 80s, because it's got uh, the hippie character. Yep. Yep. Uh, um, that, uh, wow. A lot of emotion in those drawings. Yeah. And, and a lot of New York. I mean, it's, it's, yep. it, I mean, this could not be anywhere but New York. Really. Well, and it's a play, because if you were to stage that, you just have a chimney, you know, basically, the way he's kind of staged it. Mm hmm. And then, yeah, and he exits into the into the staircase. You know, it's it's funny because you start as a kid, you start all big budget, whatever you can do on the blank piece of paper, right? And kind of you know play with the real estate. And the older you get, the more it becomes like a low budget film. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you, Jerry Kraft. Thank you, David Haydu. Thank you, Paul Levitz. Thank you, Dean Hasbiel. Thank you, Travis Langley, behind the scenes. And. Uh, Thank you, Danny, for having me. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Travis. Thank you, everybody. This was fun.